Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Planning and Prevention Techniques for Dust Explosions. I'm your moderator, Lisa Cleaver, Digital Content Editor for Feed and Grain Magazine. Our speaker today is Jim Siebert, Director of Safety, Education, and Training at the National Grain and Feed Association. Before we get started, I want to mention that we will have time to answer questions at the end of the presentation. You can submit them at any time during the webinar using the chat window. We're also recording today's webinar and you'll be emailed a link to view it on demand within the next week. You can also go to our website live.feedandgrain.com and view it on our webinar archive page. I'd like to take a quick moment to thank our sponsor CPM. CPM is a leading supplier of process equipment and systems for the animal feed, oil seed, and other essential industries. CPM equipment is built to perform under the most challenging conditions day in and day out. With an enviable reputation and history of innovation and engineering, customers can get the very best from CPM. You can learn more about them at cpm.net. Once again, I want to thank you all for spending part of your day with us. And with that, I'll turn things over to Jim. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jim Seibert with the NGFA. Uh, happy to be here with you all um, this afternoon. So here's our agenda uh, for today. We're going to discuss planning and prevention techniques for dust explosions, uh, grain dryer fire prevention, and interaction with emergency responders. A couple learning objectives. These are my hopes for your takeaway from this presentation um, that you'll be able to explain mitigation techniques to reduce the potential for dust explosions, describe measures for preventing grain dryer fires and better interact with emergency responders and incident command. So moving right into it here, planning and prevention for uh, techniques for dust explosions. Uh, fuel sources were identified as two from grain dust and six unknowns. Grain types were identified in two cases as corn, two as wheat, Two is mixed feed, one is rice, and one is dietary fiber. Uh, dust explosions uh, from 2020 occurred in eight different states. In 2019, uh, eight grain dust explosions happened, and last 10-year average uh, is 8.1 per year. Of the five components required for an explosion, only two can be controlled effectively. Ignition sources through inspections, maintenance processes, design and engineering, and fuel grain dust through housekeeping, design and engineering. Remove any one side of the Pentagon and we can stop an explosion from happening at our facility. The following slides are going to discuss techniques to control these two sides of the Pentagon. Housekeeping is an important part of any safety and health program, uh, especially in facilities where combustible dust materials may accumulate. Uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration's Grain Handling Standard 1910.272 uh, requires the employer to develop and implement a written housekeeping program to help eliminate these potential dangers. Uh, planned components, uh, written instructions, frequency of inspections, frequency of cleaning, methods of cleaning, spills and leaks, and dust control equipment um, are all listed under the 272 as uh, components required under a housekeeping plan. So uh, a couple steps here. Uh, first step of housekeeping is to identify. We want to identify priority housekeeping areas in grain elevators that are known to be potential sources of ignition. OSHA requires that these include floor areas within 35 feet of the inside bucket elevator legs, enclosed areas containing grinding equipment, and enclosed areas containing grain dryers located inside the facility and to immediately remove dust accumulations whenever they exceed an eighth inch, report spills and leaks and resolve the causes before resuming operation. So the picture on the left, uh, both of these uh, photos are for the, the shock and awe. The picture on the left was taken from a grain elevator and the picture on the right, um, that is a, a sawmill, uh, but 
some of us have been in situations or in some uh, pits where we've seen things that can get close to this. So the next step is we want to address. Um, address the methods for removing grain spills from work areas, which include sweeping, shoveling, and vacuuming, blowdown and or washdown. Note that the use of compressed air to remove dust is permitted by OSHA only when all machinery that presents a source of ignition in the area is shut down and all other known potential ignition sources are removed or controlled. The next step is to clean. Clean and inspect priority areas daily other areas inside the grain elevator, but outside of the priority housekeeping areas should be inspected and cleaned at least weekly or more frequently if needed. Surrounding outside areas should be checked weekly and cleaned as needed. It's a lot of bees wings going on uh, on this bin deck here. And the last step is to report. Report and clean up spills and leaks promptly. Resolve the cause of the leaks and spills before resuming operations. Dust collection systems need to be maintained on a regular basis to remain effective. Leaks need to be repaired as soon as possible and dust collection bags need to be replaced as needed. Employees should notify their supervisor or manager of any housekeeping concerns at any time. So a preventative maintenance program, uh, the 1910-272 paragraph M covers the requirements for employees to implement preventative maintenance procedures. One, regularly scheduled inspections of at least the mechanical and safety control equipment associated with grain stream processing equipment, filter collectors, bucket elevators, grain drying systems. Two, lubricants and other uh, appropriate maintenance in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations or as determined necessary by prior operating records. This is a brief list of requirements from OSHA grain handling standard under paragraph M. I suggest that users of this presentation visit the standard to learn more about OSHA requirements for certification records for each inspection piece of equipment. Promptly correct dust collection systems, which are malfunctioning or operating below uh, designed efficiency. Promptly correct or remove from service overheated bearings and slipping or misaligned belts associated with bucket elevators. Some industry experts uh, would rank the most common ignition sources as bearing failure, rubbing, or hot work. Hazard monitoring equipment is available that can address the first two items. The third being hot work has its own paragraph F of the grain handling standard. Control hazard, uh, control equipment and hazard monitoring, zero speed or motion sensors, bearing temperatures, belt alignments, uh, chain brakes and plug sensors are all things that can be purchased and installed on your equipment to help monitor uh, uh, to, to help as a hazard monitoring system for your facility. And two, add inspection uh, of control equipment to the PM program. So in your monthly inspection or your monthly uh, facility um, overview, uh, go into your uh, preventative maintenance program and uh, add all these uh, control equipment or hazard monitoring equipments to your inspection checklist. You know, that's your rub blocks, that's your uh, testing your bearing temperature differentials. Um, some people use or some companies will use freeze spray to offset the temperature and, and to trip the alarm to make sure that everything is working. So moving into grain dryer fire prevention now. Um, Grain dryers uh, requires direct heat grain dryers to be equipped with automatic uh, controls that will shut off the fuel supply in the event of a power or flame failure or interruption of air movement through the exhaust fan and will stop the grain from being fed into the dryer if excessive temperature occurs in the exhaust of the drying section. Um, the 29, the 1910-272P 
uh, covers the continuous flow bulk uh, raw grain dryers and um, all plays an important role in preserving grain quality during storage. Uh, we want to protect that market value and reduce potential bin engulfment and entrapment hazards by uh, drying down the grain, but there's specific rules involved uh, or regulations in um, the operation of that dryer. Even though there's uh, different types and designs, each need to be maintained according to the manufacturer's recommendations uh, or more frequently as needed, dependent upon your operational history. <clears throat> Common causes of dryer fires, uh, plugging of grain flow can result in uh, the smoldering of grain or foreign material in the grain within the dryer. Uh, this can result in a dryer fire and or the conveying of smoldering or hot grain to uh, a storage bin. A mechanical failure, a proper maintenance plan and established fire prevention measures can limit uh, dryer downtime during harvest and reduce potential injury and or property loss. And uh, third, common causes inadequate operator training. Operating dryers at excessive temperatures can increase the risk of fire. Therefore, many dryers have automatic shutoffs if temperatures reach a critical level. Other significant contributors to increased dryer fire risks include the lack of timely cleaning and inspection of the manufacturer's recommended susceptible areas. So dryer fire prevention tips, uh, the startup. After uh, an, an effective preventative maintenance program is important for reducing potential grain dryer fires. Following uh, are some of the preventative maintenance tips for grain dryer startup, cleaning and shutdown. An annual inspection by the manufacturer or a reputable dryer service provider, a fuel line pressure test and inspection Inspect all grain handling equipment, fill and discharge conveyors in the distributor. Check operating controls for function. Check and test any installed hazard monitoring systems. Ensure that all emergency discharge gates are closed and there's no residual grain material or grain related material from the previous use in the distributor or columns. Uh, remember to remove the tarp from the burner. Uh, I get those calls um, during the drier season uh, rather often. So dryer maintenance, proper cleaning prevents dryer fires. Follow the manufacturer's cleaning priority schedule. Some areas of the dryer are a higher priority and require more frequent cleaning than others. Typically manufacturers recommend cleaning at least, at least every 24 hours of operation but every 12 hours is a best practice or every shift rotation. Allow the dryer to cool before entering and follow company facility procedures prior to entry. Um, that bullet there is uh, follow the company or facility procedures prior to entry. It depends on your company's policy on how you want to treat certain spaces within the dryer. Cover the burner with a tarp, especially if cleaning with water. Dryer maintenance for an extended shutdown. Empty the dryer completely, thoroughly inspect all portions of the dryer for material buildup, clean these areas if necessary. If applicable, open the drain valves on the fuel supply. Leave the tarp over the burner, place it so it does not create a funnel and collect water. Um, I've seen uh, a couple different examples of how to uh, cover the burner with the tarp. Um, some have drilled holes and bolted up a metal frame uh, so that the tarp would peak and, and force the water away. And I've also seen another uh, pretty nifty setup where they've used PVC pipe. Um, but if you just lay the tarp there, as you can see from this picture, uh, it can collect water and, and then water in the burner is, is not good. Provide a fire watch after the dryer has been shut down. 
So if uh, uh, I am moving along at a, a fairly good clip here, um, if you guys have questions, I know that uh, we're going to have some time at the end. But if you want to submit the questions uh, as I'm rolling through the sections, um, we'll try to handle them as they pop up. So moving into the next phase, we want to talk about interaction uh, with emergency responders. OSHA requires a written EAP for workplaces with 10 or more employees. 10 employees or less, uh, that plan can be orally communicated. And written plans have specific requirements from OSHA. Um, a written plan is always required, but a training material, um, if you have 10 employees or less, that plan can be communicated orally versus having a, a set up or established training program. To meet the OSHA requirements, the EAP at a minimum is to include procedures for reporting a fire or other emergency, um, emergency evacuation, including types of evacuations and exit route assignments, designated employees who are to remain to perform critical plant operations before evacuating. Um, this could be the shutting down of uh, certain pieces of equipment shutting off the, the fuel supply or gas supply to the dryer. Um, account for all employees, customers and visitors and employees performing rescue and medical duties. And so those are the minimum requirements of by OSHA for your facilities EAP. The 272 emergency action plan uh, says the employer shall develop and implement an emergency action plan uh, with requirements contained in the point three eight general industries emergency action plan. Be familiar, uh, and these are best practices for all workplaces, you need to be familiar with OSHA's EAP regulations. Invite local first responder agencies to the facility to discuss the EAP. So going a little bit off script here, um, a lot of the success that companies have are when they have a relationship with the first responders in their area. And um, setting up EAP drills, um, bringing in employees on a Saturday or staying later on a Friday and having a rural fire department or EMS team that would be responding uh, to your facility. You know, we used to just call it hot dogs and hamburgers. And then we would do, uh, we, would, we would take one of their, um, dummies and we would place it in the facility and we would talk about hey, what's uh, what rescue efforts do we need to take. Um, so I, I think we're going to hit on that a, a little bit more here, but provide first responders with maps and egress routes of the facility. Uh, first responder, I know that not all facilities were spread out all across the country. Uh, I spoke with a company the other day that they're their uh, response time was an hour and 15 minutes from their rural fire department. And it was a volunteer fire department. And so um, the staffing and the volunteers for the rural fire department uh, really inhibited the response time uh, of getting people there with the necessary equipment. And so they were discussing standing up their own uh, response team. Uh, that company also handed over their emergency action plan to that uh, rural fire department and they had maps of the facility and when they conducted their EAP drills and they had them over for hot dogs and hamburgers, they could walk the facility and use the map and circle on their, uh, their copy. Here's choke points. Here's, here's where we're going to have uh, difficulty in getting our responders um, through with all of their equipment on. So consult with the safety and regulatory specialist when designing new facilities and or facility upgrades concerning appropriate locations and types of egress. Conduct and document appropriate EAP training with employees. Uh, in, in OSHA's eyes, if uh, you say that it happened and it's not, it's not documented, um, it didn't happen. So documentation is everything. Conduct and document annual EAP exercises and make plan improvements as necessary. Um, another good example of one of these exercises is if you have office personnel at your facility. 
Um, it could be an inclement weather drill. And where is our inclement weather fallout? Uh, do we have a tornado shelter? Or is the answer that we're going to go to the lowest part of uh, our facility? Do we have a boot pit? Um, things of that nature. Well, kicking off the exercise uh, and all call on the radio or an intercom call in the office. Uh, and then you start your clock. And then uh, the amount of time it takes to get all employees into that area, you come, you come back out and you do an after action review. And that's where you ask uh, those that were involved with the exercise, what did you notice? Did we take too much time? Um, was the communication effective? Uh, did, were the operations employees staged along your path, pointing you in what direction to go to get to uh, the exit? Um, gathering points outside of a facility, maybe there was a facility incident, um, like there's a fire or there's a, an explosion. Um, where are the gathering points? Is there a point A? Is there a point B? And what different alarm sound or what different incident requires you to go to one or the other. So building upon the EAP plan for your facility always uh, is imperative. Our interactions with emergency responders should begin prior to the emergency. So we want to establish rapport with local first responders like your sheriff or fire department by inviting them to tour your facility, provide them your EAP and facility layout diagram ask them for their feedback and coordinate EAP exercises. Facility managers should be aware of how a fire control operation likely will occur, who will be present, what problems may arise, and what salvage procedures to use in the aftermath of a fire or explosion. Control of an emergency situation should be maintained to prevent confusion and improper action that may lead to unnecessary injury or property loss. During a fire emergency, the facility manager and fire official in charge work together to bring the fire under control, assure safety of employees, firefighting, media, spectators, etc. When arriving at the scene of a fire, the fire official in charge will establish a command post in an area outside of the danger zone to direct and observe tactical operations. The facility manager should be involved actively in an advisory and cooperative capacity and provide assistance where and when needed. Both the fire chief and manager or his or her designee should outline together their main objectives and actions for bringing the fire emergency under control, such as assisting injured personnel, rescuing trapped workers, taking headcounts and containing the fire. A staging area should be set up for extra fire department equipment and personnel. Extra crews should remain at the staging area to receive orders from the command post concerning the placement of manpower and equipment. The facility's emergency action plan will list the actions and responsibilities to, to be taken by employees. The on-scene facility manager should confirm that all appropriate tasks have been accomplished. Among these actions are that the fire command officer has been met upon his or her arrival at the site and that a responsible facility employee is available throughout the firefighting effort to, con, uh, to coordinate and assist. Employee headcounts have been taken quickly and reported so that rescue operations can begin if needed. The facility area and all entrances and exits, and exits have been secured. Contact has been initiated and is being maintained with relatives of missing employees. The status of power, water, and gas utility, on, off, portable generators, et cetera, is being monitored. Facility employees and or security personnel are keeping spectators under control. Only emergency officials and approved employees should be allowed on the scene. A company spokesman, spokesperson, is providing briefings to the media and mutual aid arrangements and plans for cranes, helicopters, et cetera, are in place. So liaisons with outside agencies. Besides fire department crews, paramedics and ambulance services, 
There likely will be other agencies or groups responding to the disaster or emergency call. Representatives of any or all of the following groups may be present at a fire or explosion scene. Facility management should consider developing a communication policy uh, with outside agencies in the media and, and the media and brief employees on the company's policy. A company should consider having a single spokesperson designated to provide factual information as it becomes available. All information from the spokesperson should be cleared by the facility manager or the incident commander before release. No outside personnel should be allowed in the immediate fire area or danger zone. All press and outside agencies should be briefed at a proper staging area. Anyone needing to contact the facility manager or the incident commander should obtain clearance through the command post. Some of these agencies might be the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, state or federal, news media, newspaper, TV crews, radio, etc. Social service groups such as Red Cross, Salvation Army, etc. Local disaster or civil defense agency, Coast Guard and port officials, law enforcement, and insurance officials. So in wrapping up, there is no substitute for an an effective housekeeping plan. Uh, create a drier service inspection plan based off your manufacturer's recommendation. Uh, the owner and operator's manual is the starting point for your company's policy for that specific uh, dryer design or model. Um, adjust the inspection frequency uh, by operational need. Um, the grain quality uh, could influence how often uh, that cleaning or maintenance needs to take place. Exercise your facility's EAP. Become familiar with your first responders. Conduct joint training and facility familiarization. Um, there's plenty of resources available at OSHA.gov. Um, they've got their quick takes sheet um, and they have several different EAP uh, examples there. Um, the National Grain and Feed Association, uh, Feed Association at ngfa.org underneath the safety tab has uh, many tools uh, that are available. And uh, Jeeps, jeeps.com, they've also got a lot of uh, information uh, available and for free. So check those out. Um, the NGFA uh, Safety, Health, and Environmental Quality Committee um, and myself have just updated the 34-year-old document, um, the original uh, Emergency Pre-Planning and Firefighters Manual from 34 years ago. Uh, we just updated it and it is now located on our website underneath the guidance document, uh, guidance document section under the safety tab. And um, that is free to download for all NGFA members. And so um, the rewrite of that document has uh, brought new technology uh, in. So 34 years ago, uh, was, it was done just prior to the grain handling standard uh, coming out. And Randy Gordon, our previous president, uh, him and some uh, ag engineering folks from some different universities wrote that in response to the grain handling standard. Uh, I believe it was in 1987. So uh, we've updated that. It's got the newest technology, newest uh, firefighting methods, um, and, and speaks extensively about how to interact with uh, emergency responders and uh, grain salvage operations. So with that, um, open to questions now. Thanks, Jim. Um, that was a lot of great information. We do have a couple of questions that came through um, chat and my email. Uh, the first one is, does NGFA have a list of preferred or vetted electricians that have expertise in the commercial egg space? Hmm. Okay, so the answer to that is no. Um, we might put ourselves in a, in a bit of a pickle with the industry if we had, um, if we started putting some recommended or vetted um, companies out there above others. Uh, so that is, 
that's the hard no first, but um, there are uh, some companies out there that do um, strategic sourcing for companies. I believe that one of the, I think the vendor that I'm familiar with is called strategic sourcing and they can cover your mill rights, uh, electricians, uh, gas providers, and you can kind of narrow it down to your area of operation. And so if, if you're a big company and you've got a facility in Colorado and the other ones in uh, Mississippi, um, it's gonna pull up different providers. And uh, it looks at the, um, looks at a financial background, looks at their safety record, and it looks at uh, some of the jobs they've done previously and to see if, if they're the level or the qualifications that you'd need at your facility. So I would recommend looking at some of those uh, sourcing agencies and see if that's a tool that you would want to use. Um, the last question I have is how often should you review fire safety and EAPs with your employees? How often should you review it? Uh, it should be reviewed in, on an annual basis. Um, again, I, I go back to the, the OSHA requirements for it, um, but an annual uh, review for your employees, an annual review uh, or more often of the program itself um, every six months. Uh, Start with the OSHA requirements, uh, paragraph M for the foundation, and then move and build off of it. And so if it says annually, um, and you've got a training program, if you wanna do it annual, hey, you've met the minimum requirements. If you want to review your policy every six months, and you put it in the calendar and you go back in and you adjust, um, and you conduct a review at that time of the program, or even if, and this is more times for myself that I discovered was um, we would have a, a, a drill and we would notify or we would notice some issues in the drill and it something went wrong. We, we lost uh, a chain of custody of equipment or of people at the time. And we would go back and we would uh, amend our emergency action plan. And so Start with the base OSHA, build from there and conduct the reviews, conduct the drills um, and have those responders to your facility. At the time you have them at your facility and they've reviewed your EAP and you might be more qualified than they are. However, they, they're coming at it from a rescue mindset, um, from a salvage mindset. They can shoot some holes in your program and if it makes sense, implement that and then annotate that you did a program review on, on this state and these changes were made. And then OSHA shows up at your door and it looks like, wow, these guys are, these folks are really on top of their EAP program. Thanks. Uh, we had another question come in. Uh, is good maintenance inspection procedures uh, in place or good human attention more important for incident prevention? Which one leads to incidents more frequently? Ooh, that is a loaded question and I, and I like it. Um, so let me make sure that I got the question right first. This is one is, is timely maintenance more important? Timely maintenance and inspection, is that more important or is the human attention to detail more important than, than the other? Um, so if I've got that right, personal opinion here. Um, I, I've had older folks at a facility that have been there for 30 or 40 years and they hear a problem and they notice a problem before anybody else knows it's a problem. They can watch the system act different. That person is just, they're, they're so valuable and they, you can't replace them. Um, that type of, uh, employee interaction and knowledge saved me so much money over uh, over my years of management. And, and I couldn't, uh, it, I just can't speak to the value that they brought. And when you don't have that person, your next bet 
is your hazard monitoring equipment that you install at the facility. Um, and it's, it takes in a, a manager or a production supervisor with a, some years under their belt walking the facility. Um, inspection and, and maintenance program, when we're following uh, the manufacturer's recommendation, it's gonna tell us, hey, these are optimal conditions for you to be inspecting this under, okay? We're gonna service the outside leg two weeks prior to harvest. And we're gonna follow the manufacturer's recommendations on how to do that service. Well, then harvest hits and it's, it's an extremely wet year. And we're stressing everything at the facility. Things are coming in uh, wetter, they're coming in heavier, they're coming in trashier, it's bringing in metal, it's bringing in rocks. And um, waiting another six months to do a, uh, an in-depth preventative maintenance and inspection might not be the answer. It might be uh, getting a team off so that they can come in on a Sunday afternoon when you're closed or a Sunday morning when you're closed during harvest and doing it. And that, that's a rare case so I would say the answer is a catch-22. There is value in, in both, but a, uh, an employee that is aware does a couple things for you. They can save on some significant loss. They're aware of hazards in the workplace. They're watching out for others. Um, and both of them are, are a big cost saving. So I'm not gonna answer a question one way or another because if you don't have the employee that's like that, you have to depend on the inspection and maintenance program. The inspection and maintenance, we never, we never deviate from that schedule. If anything, we add to it, dependent upon what factors are at play. But that seasoned employee, he's, he or she has seen this exact thing at least a couple times in their career. You know, So they know what's happening and they're gonna give you a heads up you know what, why don't we switch pits here and let's run out another leg and let's do a quick inspection and a clean out on there and see what's been happening because a, this is not like last harvest. So sorry to deflect that question. I, I hope I, I shared at least some ideas. No, that was a good answer. Really good question too. So thank you for that. Uh, one quick question I noticed um, someone asked about the NGFA.org website. Is it under maintenance and will it be back soon? It will be, it might be under maintenance. We did some significant overhauls. Um, and so uh, it should be back um, very soon. Uh, I, I don't know the time frame. I just got notified of it uh, this week that we were gonna be doing some maintenance and some, some upgrades. So um, it will be back soon, uh, but let me walk you to um, where you're gonna find some information again, ngfa.org. And as soon as you pull up the home page, if you're an NGFA member, you're going to be given an option to uh, log in. Um, if you're not, there's a, a couple different things here. But if you're not a member, you come to the home page, there's an issues tab at the top. Click on that issues, a drop down menu comes up and it'll talk about feed, uh, Food Safety Modernization Act, a couple different issues that the NGFA are, are on and tracking. Click on safety and that'll take you to our safety home page. Um, if, if there were 100 items, 99 of them are free, and there's a few that are perks for membership because they cost a lot of money to produce. Um, but safety tip sheets, uh, there's free videos that are there for bin entry um, and grain quality management um, and, and dust mitigation techniques, uh, some videos that I've produced over the last couple of years. Um, guidance, uh, manuals. Uh, the walking and working surface guidance document is under the guidance manual section. Uh, the firefighters manual uh, is there as well, and that is a, a membership perk. Um, so you can purchase it if you're a non-member, um, and it, it's free to member, uh, member companies. So NGFA.org, issues, safety, and then it's all on that one page, and just download it. Uh, so many of those safety tip sheets or the, the little industry notifications that I've done, they're no more than one to three pages full of pictures because I'm an old army guy that I like pictures more than words. Um, it's just a toolbox talk. Uh, that, that 
uh, toolbox talk. All the guys got to do or gals got to do is print it out, leave it on the break room table, add it to their five minute spiel at the beginning for their planning day. And it just brings awareness to a vehicle struck by, a MSDS sheet change, uh, something simple. A, hey, we're doing a hot work today. Guys, here's a safety tip sheet over hot works and I just want to review it really quick with you. So um, that's all there and, and feel free to help yourself and hopefully the website and the smart people that are working on that get it straightened up here pretty quick. Thanks, Jim. Um, and thank you guys all for joining us. That's all I have for questions. Um, if you have additional questions, you, uh, you can see Jim's uh, contact information on the screen. Uh, you can send them directly to him or shoot me an email. In a week, we'll be sending out a link to both the uh, recording of today's webinar and uh, Jim's presentation. So that's all I have. Have a great day, guys. Thanks.